I want to uh, say the lecture today should be easier than my last lecture. I know that isn't much of a claim, but we don't have to do any of that a priori nonsense in this lecture. So this, this lecture should be easier, although remember I lied in the other lecture and said that one was easy, so maybe I'm lying again. You'll, we'll have to find out. Now what I, what I want to do in this lecture is discuss a, a couple themes you'll find in Mises' writings, and especially in Mises, you'll find this in some of the other Austrian economists also, but these themes we find especially in Mises, and I think if you can take note of these particular patterns of argument, you'll have uh, at least the start of getting a good grasp on what Mises was up to in his writing. Now, uh, at the time Mises was writing, uh, you know, we, uh, say in the period, say, from 1920 through the 60s, uh, socialism was a much more of an, uh, what William James called a live option for people than it is now. Nowadays, we don't have very many explicit socialists, and it's, uh, uh, by socialists, I mean someone who thinks that uh, the government should own all the means of production, that the economy should be run by a centralized plan. At the time Mises was writing, that was something that many people favored. Uh, a lot of people uh, like to talk about the Soviet experiment. They've said oh, uh, they're applying science to building a new society, and if they're having some rough spots, we should just kind of uh, wait to see what happens, give them a chance. Uh, I said when they talk about the uh, Soviet experiment, it reminds me of the uh, medieval phrase, experimentum in vile, which my greatest teacher, Walter Starkey, used to translate, do it to the dog first. <laughs> but so, uh, as I say, uh, people, socialism was a live option, and Mises, in a great deal of his writing, was concerned to uh, counter the socialist arguments. Now, one of the main socialist arguments, and you'll still find people giving this argument today, is that under capitalism or the free market, uh, the means of production are owned by a small group, namely the capitalists, the business people, and that the the masses are really exploited by the, this uh, small group of people. This is a very common theme in uh, Marxism, and, but also held by other views as well. So the argument against the free market is, well, under the free market, it's just the small group that's in charge. The people are really, the masses of the people, really are not in control of things. Now, one way to counter that argument would be to say, and so the socialists said, well, un uh, that's what's wrong with capitalism. And so under socialism, socialism, the means of production are controlled by the government, but the government is really all of us. So under socialism, it's the means of production are democratically controlled. Uh, so and then this argument uh, makes a contrast between capitalism, where you have just a small group of wicked capitalists in control, and socialism, where it's the masses of the people in control. Of course, as it turned out in Russia, the masses of the people were led by the so-called vanguard party, the communist party, so it turned out to be a dictatorship. But the socialist propaganda said, no, it's the masses of people are in control under socialism, so this is better than capitalism where you just have a few small group in control. 
Now, one way to counter that would be to say, say along the lines uh, Murray Rothbard and others took, say, well, uh, individuals have certain natural rights, and these include the rights include the right to acquire property individually. So, if under the free market there are particular individuals who only means of production. There is nothing at all wrong with that. That's, in fact, uh, people are exercising their natural rights. But Mises didn't take that line uh, for the quite good reason. He didn't believe in natural rights. What he did, and this is a very characteristic theme you'll find in his writing, he would try to take the premise that the opponent of the free market had and show that the free market would better fulfill whatever it was that the opponent of the free market favored. So the opponent of free mar the free market here is saying under capitalism, it's the small group that's in control Whereas under socialism, it's the whole people are in control. So Mises is going to counter that by saying, no, under capitalism, it's really the masses are in control. Now, how, what is his argument for that? Well, it's a very simple one. He says, in the free market, uh, business people are trying to make profit in the way you make profit is to supply some good or service that consumers want. Uh, if you can, uh, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. Uh, I don't know whether, whether he actually said that, but we can see the principle of what that he said is quite true, unlike many other things that Emerson said, which usually, usually false, that's to say, the ones that have a discernible meaning, which is only about maybe 10% of them. Uh, so the idea is if, if you want to make money under the free market, you have to come up with some product that people want. So Mises speaks of the dollar votes of consumers that people are really voting by spending on what on various products on who should be in control of the means of production. If ah, they're playing my song just a second. <laughs> So you see how Mises is countering the socialist argument. The socialist said, look, under the free market, it's a small group of people who are in control. So Mises said, no, the people who seem to be in control are really just servants or of the consumers because they're trying to make a profit and to make a profit they have to supply what the consumers want. So it's really the consumers' preferences that are running the show. And Mises uh, taking over a phrase from the British economist uh, W.H. Hutt, who taught for most of his career in South Africa. Uh, Hutt coined the, used the phrase consumer sovereignty. Mises takes this over. So he says that uh, it's really the free market is a system of consumer sovereignty. I should mention, Hutt is one of the was a great economists, but he's very, had a very difficult style. In fact, someone, I think it was Richard Ebeling, said that he wrote in Huttite. Uh, yes, that was supposed to be funny. Uh, <laughs> okay, now, there's an objection, kind of an obvious objection one could give to... Uh, this argument, namely that under capitalism, it's the uh, consumers who are really in control because the consumers are the one, the, the, the business people are trying to please the consumers. 
So it's really the consumers who are in control. Now the objection is, and you'll find this objection uh, given, say, by the uh, uh, Cambridge economist Maurice Dobb, who taught at Cambridge during the 1930s. He was also a, rec a recruiting agent for Soviet espionage. But he said, well, look, you can talk about dollar votes, but rich people have many more dollar votes than poor people. So isn't it still the case that uh, capitalism is, an, un is uh, an objectionable system? Because you can say, well, uh, people vote according to the, the, the production depends on the votes, as it were, of the consumers, but rich people have a lot more votes. But Mises was well prepared for this objection. He answered that even if individual rich people have, say an individual rich person has more votes than any poor person, still, the if you add up all the votes of the masses of the people, you'll get an extremely substantial amount. And he, Mises describes capitalism as mass production for the masses. So even if it's the case that rich people individually have more dollar votes, their, their votes are really not able to uh, outweigh the votes of the masses. Now there's another point that's related to that is where the free market compares favorably with political democracy. In a democracy, say, as we have in the US, if, if in fact we have a democracy, uh, say we have two candidates for president, well, the ones who voted for the losing candidate don't get what they want. It's a winner take all. Now we could have modifications that there are systems of proportional representation where uh, parties that d don't get that many votes still get representation in the legislature, but it's still the case if you're on the losing side, you would not get what you voted for. But under the free market, it, many more preferences can be satisfied. Uh, you say if you uh, if you want something, say you had you want some product that not too many people want. Say you want pro wrestling <laughs> memorabilia. There won't say as long as there are some people who want this, then the market will tend to supply it. You don't have to have your preference uh, voted for by everybody. So a lot of people can get their rather idiosyncratic preferences satisfied. So if you want a copy of Luthez's autobiography, you'll be able to get it, even though that isn't a bestseller, unfortunately. Uh, now, I use the phrase uh, consumer sovereignty, but there's an, a very interesting objection that Murray Rothbard raised to this that he said, well, it's really wrong to talk about sovereignty because sovereignty is a political term. And if we say, somebody say that we say in the United States, uh, the, uh, we talk about the sovereignty of the government or the sovereignty of the, of the states. Well, this means the government can give us orders. And if we don't obey these orders, then they can use force against us, say, if you decided you didn't want to pay your uh, tax bill to the IRS and you just didn't send the money, well, they're going to keep sending you letters. And if you don't answer those, they'll eventually come and uh, make a call on you. And they can really, uh, they could, if you kept resisting, they could actually shoot you. You'd be forced to pay. You wouldn't have a choice of whether to pay or not. But Rothbard said, well, look, this isn't the case in the free market. Suppose uh, some businessman says, look, 
I don't care what the consumers want. I'm just going to produce things my way. Let's suppose somebody has a restaurant and said, I'm going to, uh, I'm, uh, this is home cooked meals here. I cooked just the way my mother did. Unfortunately, his mother burned everything. <laughs> so people aren't going to like what he, what that restaurant is serving. But it's his restaurant. He can do it if he wants. So it isn't really the uh, Rothbard objective. This isn't really consumer sovereignty. People, the business businesses aren't under the same kind of control as people are in the political system. Uh, I think Rothbard's point is quite right, but it doesn't really tell against the substance of what Mises was saying. Incidentally, Mises was quite aware of this point. He said it's not the same, uh, that consumer sovereignty isn't the same as political sovereignty. But the point is that, <clears throat> say, businesses that don't try to please the consumers will tend to go out of business. If, if say, you had a restaurant and you served products that people didn't want, they just didn't like the food you prepared, then people wouldn't go to that restaurant and you'd eventually go out of business. So you could, you, you can refuse to do what the consumers want, but people who do that will tend to be replaced by those who are motivated by pleasing the consumers. Uh, now, we now have another problem, is if what I've said is right, uh, we can understand how businesses di that directly supply the consumers are, uh, will be guided by consumer preferences. That's say, if again, uh, say restaurants will be trying to uh, serve food that their customers want. We can easily see how this works for consumer products, but a lot of the economy doesn't consist of products that are directly sold to, sold to consumers. We also have producers' goods or capital goods, good, <laughs> goods that are used to produce other goods. And as you would have gotten in uh, other lectures, I'm sure uh, Roger Garrison mentioned this in his lecture, that you have stages of production. You can have producers' goods that are used to produce consumer goods, and you can have other production goods that are used to produce the first level production goods and so on. So what about all the producers' goods? The consumers aren't choosing them. So then one could say, is it the case then that the uh, consumer sovereignty to the extent it exists is limited. The dollar votes are just for the uh, consumer goods. But this isn't right because we could ask, well, what determines the demand for the producer's goods? Well, <coughs> at the, for the first level producer's goods, we'll get the people who are producing consumer's goods. So the, the preferences, it, and then we so to get what which uh, what that demand is, we have to know who are the which consumers firms are going to be the ones that are demanding the producers' goods. But we already know the answer to that. Those are the cons the uh, producers of consumers' goods that please the consumers. So those people are going to be the ones who will be the demanders of the first level production goods. And if that's, and we can then just extend that more and more, that the, the demand for the higher stage of production will be based on the next lower stage demand. So once we're given the consumer's demand, that will determine the demands of the whole system. So it really is the uh, consumer's demands that are running the, the show, and the details of that are you can find in, uh, in uh, Mises and Rothbard. 
<clears throat> Fortunately, I don't have to give those details. It's not, it's not my, I mean, I, I get to concentrate on awful subjects like the a priori and the details of the structure <laughs> of production are left to other people who understand them. Uh, so, as I say, <coughs> the ones who produce the consumer goods will demand the first level pr production goods, and they're trying to get them at the least cost. So the ones who, uh, I guess that point rings a bell with someone. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, uh, tell them the consumer demand doesn't permit me to answer <laughs> right now. Uh, Okay, so I've gone over this. That the producers of the first level production goods will be trying to meet demands of those who produce consumer goods. Producers of the second level production goods will try, be, try, try to meet demands of those who produce first level production goods. So it's consumer demand thus determines all production. Now, there's another problem. You, uh, objections to the free market are very, very common people. Uh, never stop raising them. Now, one further objection really uh, takes off from just the point I've been making. The point I've been making, whether successfully or not, is for you to judge, is that in the free market, uh, the business people are trying to satisfy the demands of the consumers, whether they're directly producing consumer goods or at some higher stage of production. And why is it that they're trying to satisfy the demands of the consumers? Well, because they're trying to make money, and the way you make money is by getting people to buy your product. So this leads to another objection, is that in this system, People are motivated by trying to make money. But the objection is, that isn't a very nice thing to be motivated by. Uh, uh, people should be motivated by other concerns, say moral concerns. They should say people should pay, always pay workers a living wage or avoid uh, charging high prices for necessities. The view would be, really, if you're concentrating on making money, that's not, that's really evil. As the uh, Bible says, you cannot serve both God and mammon. Mammon, of course, is a term for money. Uh, you know, incidentally, Samuel Butler once said about that phrase, you cannot serve both God and mammon. Uh, difficult, no doubt, but nothing worth doing in life is easy. Uh, <clears throat> of course, one response to this, say we could imagine the uh, objectivist response of Ayn Rand is that making money is good. It, it is a good thing. But again, <clears throat> this isn't the line Mises takes because remember once more, he doesn't believe in objective ethics, not just in the sense of rejecting the objectivist system, but he doesn't think there are standards of good and bad that are just true or false. He just thinks ultimately there are subjective preferences. So he's not going to respond by saying, look, you're wrong, money, making money is good. Uh, what his response is to say, well, supposing the business person acts according to some other standard, say the business person says, look, I could make uh, money, say, on this medication by charging a lot of money, but I'd rather make it available to poor people, so I'm going to sell it at a very low price. <clears throat> well, what happens if people do, if business people do that, then the this mechanism that I explained in the first part of the lecture won't be operating because the key to that system is that business people are trying to satisfy the demands of the consumers and that 
what motivates them to do that is the pursuit of profit. So if they're not pursuing profit, then there won't be a mechanism, or at least not that mechanism, for getting the production to satisfy what the consumers want. Business people will be producing according to whatever standards they think are appropriate. Now, the problem here is uh, that, suppose you said, okay, well, that's all right. People should just follow certain rules of morality, determine what to produce. Uh, Mises raises the problem. He said, well, the people who say that are just giving certain general statements like people should get a living wage or we should have fair prices, but they don't give any criterion of what the correct prices or wages are. They just said, well, people should be fair. People shouldn't just go after money as much as possible, but they don't have any rules for what prices are, and this will lead to chaos in the economy. If, uh, say, people, if a, uh, business people don't charge the market price, for something that'll lead to either surpluses or shortages. We won't be able to coordinate the economy without the market prices did, that are where we have people where we have the businesses are responding to consumer demand based on their pursuit of profit. If they're not pursuing profit, that's going to derail the whole system. Incidentally, if you'll pardon, I'm a very old man, so I can perhaps make a few a digression or two. You notice I use the word criterion. If, if the singular is for my, we taught you speak of a criterion. The singular is not criteria. One hears, unfortunately, people say, we don't have a criteria for this. But that pe one really shouldn't say that. I remember when I was in... Uh, Friedrich Hayek's class a long time ago, a student used the word phenomena in the singular, and Hayek stopped him and he said, oh, that hurts his ears, Would please don't say that. So that, that was, I, I think that's worth noting, it was a ver quite singular phenomenon. Uh, okay, so uh, when Mises makes this point, namely that the system of uh, free enterprise depends on the pursuit of profit by the business people, by the entrepreneurs, he's not making a value judgment. He's not saying, if you say that uh, people should just charge fair prices, you're saying something that's bad or you're you're making an ethically wrong judgment. He's not saying, well, I like the free market, so we should do it this way, even though it's quite obvious he does like the free market. What he's doing is just calling attention to the consequences of a particular policy. So he's saying, we need prices market prices for economic calculation. We're not going to get them without the entrepreneur pursuing profit. When he says that, that's a descriptive statement, it's a scientific statement, it's either true or false. <laughs> it, it isn't a value judgment. It's, just, it, uh, it's a statement of what are the consequences of a particular policy. So you see, this is a characteristic pattern that Mises uses, he's saying, rather than give his own ethical opinions, he's going to say, let's take what you want, what you, the objective capitalism want, he's going to show what you say won't work. In, in this, and in doing that, he's, uh, he's making value-free claims. Now, we've been talking so far about socialist criticisms of the free market. I say, 
the socialist says that the, the economy should be run by a system of government control instead of having businesses uh, decide on what to produce independently of one another. We have a central plan where the government runs everything. And as I mentioned, that was a very popular system when Murray, I mean, when Mises was writing, but it isn't so favored now. But there's another way, I'm sure, as I'm sure you all know, that the government can interfere with the free market besides taking over production of goods and services. And in this, the government doesn't abolish the market, but it passes laws that restrict market transactions in certain ways. For example, uh, price control, which would include minimum wage laws and rent control and tariff. Uh, price control usually is one that has a maximum price saying you can't charge more than such and such for uh, prices, say, Imagine there is a, a big, uh, some kind of a, a hurricane, and then people want gasoline. So if you had a price control law, it said something like, you can't charge more than $6 a gallon for gasoline. That would be an example. Price control. <coughs> minimum wage laws are a form of price control, but it's a minimum price. It would say you can't employ someone for less than particular amount. Rent control, again, would be a maximum price. You can't charge more than a certain amount for an apartment. It, uh, tariffs are another type of intervention. That uh, would be a tax on foreign goods that are imported into a country. Now, uh, again, we're going to see a pattern of argument that Mises uses that's quite similar to the one he used in uh, refuting the socialist claim, or replying to the socialist claim, that under the free market, it's just a small group of evil capitalists who are controlling everything. <coughs> what Mises is going to do with interventionism is, first he takes the goal that the interventionist wants, and then he says, the intervention that you're proposing won't enable you to achieve this goal. It, it'll fail. And you notice once more, and this is a point I'm particularly concerned to stress, that this is not a value judgment on his part. He's not saying uh, interventionism is bad or I don't like interventions. He's just saying if you if you try to put into effect a certain interventionist measure, it's not going to work. You have to be a bit careful there because it's extremely likely true that Mises himself would make the value judgment interventionism is bad or people who were at, at, uh, attracted to Austrian economics saying who believed, unlike Mises, in an objective ethics might would very likely think uh, price control is ethically bad. But even if people hold that view, it's still the case that if one says that the intervention doesn't work, that's not a value judgment. Uh, now, <coughs> let's take an example of price control. And this is, uh, I used uh, this uh, example of price control on milk because it's one that Mises himself uses. So uh, the government, we imagine, uh, says uh, it's very hard for poor people to buy enough milk, say they need milk for their small children, but the price of milk is too high. So the government isn't going to be cowed by that situation. It's well, I see at least one person laughed at that, good. Uh, okay, so the government said, well, let's, if we lower the price of milk, that'll make it more, milk more available for poor people. So the government then, 
decides to impose a maximum price on milk in order to make it easier for the poor to buy milk. Uh, now, what's going to happen if the government does that? Well, the price of milk is now lower, so more people are going to there's going to be greater quantity of milk demanded than before, because we know uh, when the uh, price decreases, the quantity demand demanded will either increase, in some cases it can stay the same, but it will never decrease, because if the price is lower, then people don't have to give up as much of other things in order to get the milk. They can get milk more easily. So there'll be more people or more people demanding milk, but suppliers aren't going to be supplying more milk. They, uh, when the uh, price goes down, they're going to be getting less for, for each, uh, each bottle of milk they, they sell, they'll have no incentive to increase production. In fact, they may decrease production. And in fact, the, what, the marginal sellers, that's to say those who were just making enough to stay in the milk supply business will be driven out of business by, the, by this regulation. Say uh, Mises is assuming that milk produ uh, the milk sellers are making not all the milk sellers are making the same rate of profit. There are some who are doing pretty well. Others are just get uh, making enough to get by on. So you can see he's assuming that the economy isn't in equilibrium because in equilibrium everybody will make the same rate of return. But here, he's assuming that there are some people who are not doing as well as others. So the ones who were just barely making enough to stay in business will go out of business. They won't be able to stay, to stay in business under the new regulation. Uh, so what is the... Uh, the upshot of all this is that the government put in the price control, the maximum price for milk, because it wanted to have milk, more milk available to people, especially to the poor. But the result is that there's less milk available. So this isn't what the price control is supposed to do. So you see, when Mises is pointing this out, once again, he's not making a value judgment. He's not saying, I don't like price control on milk. It, he's just saying, this is what ha this was what will happen. You won't get what you want if you, if you have price control on, on milk. It'll make uh, people leave the... Uh, the milk supply business. Incidentally, I didn't put a slide on it. But we uh, we can have there's one there a uh, couple cases by the way where there are exceptions to this this general principle where if you have a uh, price control, it will drive the marginal sellers out. They'll they'll shift their resources to other more profitable businesses. Uh, <clears throat> One case where it wouldn't is suppose all the, the resources in a particular line of work are completely specialized. They're all used up. It, they're all used in that industry. And there's, there's nowhere else they could go profitably. Then they won't leave the industry as long as the the business can make a profit at all. They won't have the incentive to say, well, now I can move to some other, some other line of work because the resources will be completely specialized. But even in that case, you'd still have the problem of greater quantity demanded at the price control 
the price set by price control then would be supplied at that price, so that wouldn't eliminate the problem. Now, once we've got that pattern for uh, price control, the rent control is very easily analyzed because it's exactly the same process. So again, the aim of rent control is to make more housing available for the poor. So what's going to happen, though, if you put in rent control? Well, at the rent controlled amount, there'll be more housing demanded than is available. So then landlords that can't make money will withdraw housing from the market, or they'll respond to the rent control by just not making repairs on their apartment. So once more, you'll have a situation where the rent control won't uh, get what the, uh, what the uh, people who favored it wanted. They say they wanted to have more housing available for the poor, but the result is less housing available. You know, I remember speaking of rent control, there was a story I'll tell you that involved, have, have any of you read uh, Robert Nozick, the great uh, libertarian philosopher, is that a name? People know, uh, no, nobody's read knows it. Uh, some people like, well, he was a very outstanding philosopher. He was a libertarian, he taught at Harvard. So he uh, got into a bit of trouble that he was renting an apartment from Eric Siegel of love story fame, but it, it turned out not to be a love story bef between them. It, it, he, he, I think he, he wanted certain repairs in the apartment, and Siegel wasn't too friendly to me, told him to talk to my lawyers. So then it turned out, Nozick looked this up, the apartment was supposed to be under rent control, and Nozick, he, he, he was paying more than that, so he sued for all the back rent plus penalty, and I think he got about $20,000. Then Siegel was a friend of the... Martin Peretz, who was the, the owner at that time, the New Republic magazine, and they published an article on this incident uh, making fun of Nozick because he was a libertarian against rent control, but he, he used the lawsuit uh, to, uh, to take advantage of this. And I remember I was uh, the... Uh, Oh, they're really playing my song now. I guess we have some some rent control people who don't don't like what I'm saying. So I remember Tom Nagel said to me, who's a, also a very well-known philosopher, he said, I don't get it. What's the inconsistency? Uh, but any any event, I just thought I'd throw that story in. Uh, why not? Okay, so as we say, rent control doesn't attain the aims that its proponents favor, again, we're not making a value judgment. So they wanted, the rent control advocates wanted more housing for the poor, but the result is they get less housing for the poor. Uh, now, uh, again, let's see this pattern once more with minimum wage laws. Now, minimum wage laws are supposed to raise wages for workers, saying, look, uh, workers, say, on, uh, say at uh, Walmart, aren't getting a living wage. Living, li the expression living wage, incidentally, is something that came in really uh, with uh, the famous encyclical of Pope Leo XIII, Rerum Novarum, which, uh, which came out in 1891. So the view there was the employer should pay the worker enough so he would be able to live and support a family. So the minimum wage advocates would say, look, so, uh, some wages don't permit workers to do that, so why don't we just have pass a law that says, employers have to pay workers enough so they'll have a, 
uh, so they'll be able to support themselves. Now, what's going to happen if they do that? Well, a minimum wage is a, a minimum price. It says prices can't fall below this amount. So if you have that, and that's higher than the market price, then more workers will want to work at this minimum wage than employers are willing to hire at that, that price. Uh, how do we know that? Well, what determines in the free market, what determines how much uh, employee is going to get, what determines wages? Well, it's basically determined by how much the employee's product is worth to the employer. If, say, you have a minimum wage and <coughs> what you produce isn't worth that to the employee, what you're, say, you have a minimum wage, let's say, of $9, but you can only produce, say, $6 worth of product per hour, then it doesn't pay the employer to hire you, he's going to let you go. You know, when you consider that, I'm wondering how it is that I managed to stay employed. <laughs> but I, fortunately, I'm not going to go into it. I hope, uh, I hope Lou Rockwell isn't listening to this, this, this particular part of the lecture. Okay, so the minimum wage law then, again, that will, is supposed to help the poor workers, saying these workers aren't getting enough to live on, but uh, it'll have the effects of, effect of making at least some of the workers unemployed. So again, it's not going to do what it's supposed to do. Again, as you'll be tired of hearing by now, but that's not going to stop me. This is not a value judgment, it's just saying this is the consequence of what's going to happen. Now, I should say there are various replies that minimum wage uh, advocates will give to that. For example, one, they'll say, well, you know, according to the theory of this, that uh, your wages are determined by the marginal productivity of the workers, the discounted marginal value product. But even if that's true, there are wide zones of indeterminacy that give room for the employees to get more. That's one of the responses. I don't think there's much to that response, but I, I'm not going to go into the controversy over that. If, uh, if uh, as the economist I mentioned before, W.H. Hutt has written on that issue if, uh, in a number of books. Uh, if you're interested in pursuing minimum wage uh, legislation further. Now, uh, again, we have, uh, we want to give one more example of this similar pattern. This is a tariff. A tariff, as I say, is a tax imposed on uh, foreign goods are imported into a country. So supposing people say, well, it's very unfair, say, producers of American cars are being undersold by Japanese cars, so we're going to impose a tariff on the Japanese car coming in, and that this will help American workers. That if you didn't have a tariff, then the uh, workers who produced American cars would lose their job because they would be out-competed by the suppliers of Japanese cars. So isn't it a good idea we just impose the tariff and this will help the uh, American workers? But what's overlooked there, it's kind of a very obvious point, is that the tariff will make the product more costly for consumers that uh, a tariff, if there's a tariff, and other, if you didn't have a tariff, say the Japanese people would have bought the Japanese car at a lower price, then the people who would have 
bought the cars are worse off. They'll have to pay more if they want a car than they otherwise would have. So they're not, they're not better off. I would say, oh, well, but look, the workers are better off. What the problem here is that the advocates of the tariff aren't taking into account the people who are harmed by it. They would just say, look, the tariff is helping such and such people. We've got to build up the manufacturing uh, sector of the economy. But they're neglecting the fact that consumers will have to pay higher prices because of the tariffs. And further, by discouraging competition, they make it easier to form cartels, let's say, uh, agreements among businesses to fix prices. Now, what happens when intervention fails? Well, uh, perhaps in an a almost ideal world, the government would say, let's forget about the intervention, let's go to the free market. I won't say in an ideal world, because in an ideal world, there wouldn't be any intervention in any government at all. But in a close to ideal world, the government would say, let's forget about the intervention and just go back to the free market. But very often the government won't do that. They'll just respond with more intervention. Uh, say, let's go back to this example of price control on milk. Well, the, say the milk sellers are, will complain they're not getting enough profit because of the price control. So the government might respond by putting price controls on the suppliers, say the ones, uh, say they, the milk suppliers will be getting their supplies of milk from dairy. So they might say, well, okay, you, those people will have to have charge lower prices. So then you'll be able, when you're selling milk to the consumers, you'll be able to make a profit even though you're selling the milk at a lower price than before because your costs will be lower. As long as your, uh, your prices are above costs, you'll be all right. Uh, you know, you want to avoid the position of the person who said uh, he, he sold below cost and someone asked him, how do you make any money if you sell below cost? He said, I make it up in volume. Uh, that wouldn't be such a good idea. Uh, okay, so what's going to happen if they do that? Well, these new interventions will also fail for the very same reason that we've already given that uh, they'll, we already explained why price control doesn't work, why it will result in greater quantity demanded than quantity supply. It'll just cause more of a shortage at the low, at the next stage. So the new interventions don't work. Now what happens if the government says, okay, well, we're not giving up, we're just going to keep having more intervention. Eventually, not it won't take very long if they just keep with more and more price control, you'll get total government control of the economy. The government will be controlling all prices. They'll start with having price controls on a few products and they'll say, well, we need to have further price controls because otherwise the, the, some of the people we're supplying the first goods will go out of business. So then they're going to extend this over the whole economy. So then you'll get total government control of the economy. And this is not just a theoretical possibility. It took place in Germany in World War One, and also happened. It was the, uh, the system there was called the Hindenburg Plan after Marshal Paul von Hindenburg, who was uh, the war one of the the, the main uh, military leader Germany during World War One. He was very very popular, uh, even though Germany didn't do that well at the end of the war but he was very popular, so the plan was called the Hindenburg Plan. And the same uh, thing happened in England during World War I, also during World War II. You had total government control of the whole economy. And I think very interesting, the uh, 
Mises says that socialism did not come to Britain, as most people will say, it with the labor government, which came in just at the end of World War II, labor government under Clement Attlee, but came in under Winston Churchill, who was ostensibly a conservative. He was a, supposed to be a supporter, at least to some extent, of the free market, but Mises said that uh, really it was Churchill who brought about socialism to England. Incidentally, uh, Churchill remarked once about Clement Attlee, who was the leader of the Labour Party. He said he's a very modest man. He has a great deal to be modest about. Uh, now, the same the system where you have a government in control of the economy, the government is setting all the price and wages, is also was also characteristic of the Nazi economy. Remember, Hitler came to power in January 30th, 1933, and he was in power till the end of World War II, 1945. But particularly after 1936, you had the German government really was in setting all the prices and wages in the economy. And this is another kind of fundamental point Mises makes that this is a form of socialism. You have socialism is not only one where the government owns the means of production and runs things by a central plan. Another form of socialism is one where it looks legally like you have private businesses and private property, but really the government is set making all the decisions. So this is also a form of socialism. And because it's a form of socialism, Mises said the Marxist interpretation of the Nazi, Nazism is completely wrong. And Marxist said that the Nazi system was really a higher, a, a stage of capitalism. They said this is capitalism with the gloves off. That's really the capitalists, the rich businessmen, the really uh, big firms who were in control under the Nazis. But in fact, this wasn't true. It was really the government that was running things. So uh, now the last point I want to make, again, is another type of intervention where Mises is using the same pattern that I've uh, given in the lecture, that many people favor very heavy taxes on the rich. So again, Mises isn't going to say, as many libertarians would, look, if you tax people, this is a form of forced labor or it's interfering with natural rights. I think those are very good points to make, but they're not the ones Mises make. He said the taxes make it more difficult for the rich to save and build up accumulations of capital. And what happens if you capital accumulates then it's going to raise the productivity of workers, and that will make wages rise. So he says taxes on the rich will really hurt the poor. So again, it's not having the consequence that the supporters of taxation on the rich say it will. So I think now we're about out of time, so I think uh, thanks very much uh, uh, as long as... You know, so don't, don't support heavy taxes on the rich will be my final me message. Thank you. <laughs>